Now, the internet has given us both of these economies. There's a commercial economy and a sharing economy. A sharing economy that's produced Wikipedia or free sound resources like OpSound or SETI at Home, places where people give their effort in exchange not for money. Indeed, if you introduced money, they'd probably give less of their efforts. And we've seen commercial economies, entities that have flourished by making products available more efficiently in the context of online services. But most interesting is the development of what we could call a hybrid. The hybrid is a commercial entity that leverages a sharing economy, or it's a sharing entity that leverages a commercial economy to produce value that it couldn't otherwise produce. So, <coughs> excuse me. Think about Flickr as an example. Flickr was born as a photo sharing site. Built into its DNA was the idea that the photographs you uploaded would be allowed for others to share. Indeed, built into the structure, the architecture from day one was the ability to license using Creative Commons licenses, photographs to be shared openly so that the community understood that they had rights to share and build upon the photographs that were in that site. Now, this sharing economy was acquired, of course, by Yahoo. Not because Yahoo decided to give away even more shareholder value to the public, but because Yahoo decided they could leverage this sharing economy into money for Yahoo, which, of course, they have, one of the most successful acquisitions Yahoo made. Or think about Yelp increasingly spreading across the United States. This is a site where people obsessively spend time giving free reviews to restaurants or to shows or anything else they'd like to rank to others on the site, sharing their views for free with, of course, the objective of Yelp being to leveraging that shared activity to money for Yelp. Or think about Second Life, this online virtual world, which when it was born literally seemed like empty green fields and blue oceans. And people have spent an enormous amount of their time for free, indeed paying for the right to spend their time building these cities and objects and characters and relationships that make this an increasingly valuable place for people to spend time in, but of course, increasingly valuable place for Linden Labs, the company that gave birth to Second Life. Now, once you see this pattern of the hybrid, I suggest you're going to see it everywhere. Think about Amazon. Is Amazon really just a commercial site? Or is Amazon's value driven by the free efforts that its users devote to making the products they sell more interesting and valuable? Apple is experiencing with the same idea. Even Microsoft, for a long time, has recognized the enormous value that comes from building a hybrid. If you go to Microsoft product support, there's an extraordinary community of people who decide to spend their Sunday mornings not at their local church, but in at their computers helping other people learn how to use Microsoft products better so that Microsoft can make more money. Now, this is not an accident. There's a community technologies group in Microsoft that studies how to make these communities flourish in a way that drives more people to want to give their free time over to making Microsoft a more profitable company, making it totally unsurprising that an event I saw him at about a year and a half ago in Berlin, Steve Ballmer announced to the group of publishers that every successful internet business will be what I've described here, a hybrid. Now, the point is to recognize the enormous promise that comes from this interaction between free culture and free markets, an enormous potential to do good for this economy and the platform of cultures that interconnect using this economy. If and only if the law began to make some sense here. So let's talk a little bit about the law, or the law. <coughs> The law is very good at looking backwards. It's very good at sending the cowboys in to deal with last generation's problems, but not very good at understanding the horizon of issues that look ahead. And so, too, are we faced with that character of law today. 
in a context where the law needs to be updated to take account of obvious features of this digital network, instead the obsession of every single legislator in the United States Congress today is focusing on something called, quote, piracy, peer-to-peer -peer piracy. Launching this war, what many in the industry call the copyright wars on people who share content without permission of the content owners. Copyright wars, which my friend, the late Jack Valenti, head of the Motion Picture Association of America, used to refer to as his own, quote, terrorist war, where apparently the, quote, terrorists in this war are our children. Now, we need to recognize something about this war. I don't support people violating other people's copyrights. And a decade ago, I was open to the idea that this actually might work, this war on illegal sharing. But this war is a war of prohibition. And this war of prohibition has not worked. If by worked, we mean reduce the bad behavior. The one thing we've learned is that peer-to-peer -peer file sharers don't appear to read Supreme Court opinions because at the time the Supreme Court made it perfectly clear that this activity was presumptively illegal, there is no substantial decline in the activity. All that this war has done is to transform a generation into criminals. Now my view is we need to think of something new here. Some of you might think GNU, but I mean just something new. We need to think first about changes in the law. The first change of the law is that the law needs to give up its architectural obsession with the copy. The idea that copyright law gets triggered every single time there is a copy made is, this is a technical legal term, just insane. The law needs to focus on something meaningful in the interaction people have with culture, and the copy is no longer meaningful. Instead, meaningful is going to be a function of how you're using the creative work that you might be copying. So if we distinguish between copying and remix, and between the professional and the amateur, we have this matrix. Copyright law presumptively regulates all of this activity under the same rules. Never before has the law reached this broadly, and it makes no sense for it to reach this broadly now. In my view, obviously copyright law needs to provide strong and efficient protection for professionals who are trying to control distribution of complete copies of their work. But equally obviously, the law needs to set free from regulation amateurs who are simply remixing other people's creative work. Not fair uses, but free uses, completely outside of the concern of copyright law so that kids at the age of 13 don't need to worry about whether they're criminals because of the creative expression they are engaging in. Now, between these two extreme cases, there's a bunch of harder cases. Amateurs sharing full copies with their 10,000 best friends obviously cannibalizes the professional market and needs to be regulated in important ways. And professionals engaging the act of remix in some contexts need to be free under the doctrine of fair use, but in some contexts need to be regulated to give the original professional the incentive that professional needs. But if you look at this map, the central message of this reform movement is a concept that was very popular, maybe a little bit less popular today, but the concept of deregulating a significant space of culture and clarifying the regulation and focusing the regulation in those places it might do good. That's the first change. The second change is this. This war against peer-to-peer -peer piracy is a decade old. And this war, as I've suggested, has been a total failure. Now, the response of some, indeed a characteristic American response to totally failed wars, is to continue to push forward, to march forward with this war, to wage an ever more effective war against the enemy. That was Jack Valenti's solution to this war. But my response is the opposite where a failed war shows no sign of success. Rather than suing kids in this war, we should be suing for peace. 